This episode contains discussion of kidnapping, rape, date rape drugs, dismemberment, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Natalie Holloway was on her senior class trip in Aruba in 2005. The graduates decided to go out with a bang on their last night on the island and went to a popular bar to have some fun and some drinks as the legal drinking age there is 18. Natalie was seen leaving the bar with a few local boys and was never seen again. It's been 18 years and neither Natalie nor her remains have ever been found. Natalie's family has never stopped looking for her and believe the Aruban police played a big role in covering up what happened to their daughter. All right, you guys, we're doing it. We're doing Natalie Holloway. We have had so many requests for this case. Mm Mm-hmm. Thanks to Destiny Schultz, Beth Stevens, Michaela, Elizabeth Grizzle, Megan Collins, Samantha Ray Taylor, Liz Young, Jessica Holloway, Melissa Doolin, Hallie Broad, Hannah Sims, and Laura for requesting it. And that's just the request on the case submission form. So if you requested it some other way, like, I don't know. A comment, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook Instagram, like whatever. That. Yeah. Thank mm-hmm. you. And yeah. thank you to Beth for writing this up. Yes. Thank you. Um. All right. Well, let's get started with who Natalie Holloway was. Natalie was born on October 21st, 1986 to Dave Holloway and Beth Twitty. She was the oldest of two, having a younger brother named Matthew. Dave and Beth ended up divorcing in 1993, and they both did eventually remarry. And Natalie um, and her brother primarily lived with Beth in Mountain Brook, Alabama, which is where Beth's husband, who they called Jug, lived. What a fun name. (laughs) Um, Natalie was a regular church-going member. She was known to be very kind. Her father, Dave, described his daughter as being energetic, kind, and someone who would do anything for anyone. Natalie was an honor student at Mountain Brook High School, as well as a member of the dance team. She was also involved in the American Field Service, where she helped exchange students adapt to life in the U.S. And Natalie earned a full academic scholarship to the University of Alabama, and she was planning on studying pre-med. And that's, I mean... A full ride to Alabama? Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Don't cry for me. Alabama. Um, She graduated from high school on May 24th, 2005, and it was the last time she had seen her father, Dave, and her stepmother, Robin. On May 26, 2005, Natalie and her classmates arrived in Ruba for their... Not not in Ruba, in Aruba. I don't know where Ruba is, but... Yeah. Might be Ed. In Aruba for their class trip, there were 124 students with seven chaperones, and the group was staying at the Beachfront Holiday Inn Resort on the northern end of the island. And we don't have specific details about the entirety of the trip, but we know where Natalie was and who she was with on their last night, which was May 29, 2005. Natalie and some does, of her... Oh, sorry. Does 124 students and only seven chaperones seem not enough? I don't know. Like... I mean, I guess they did okay for the most most of the time, but and it, it wasn't like an official class trip. The school didn't like sponsor it. It was just like an informal people got together kind of thing. But I don't know. I just 124 students and only seven chaperones. But I guess I'm thinking through the lens of like seven year olds, which is like what my kids would do on a field trip right now. But Um, And I know some people are really critical of Beth even letting Natalie go, but I mean, she was 18. She could have gone if her mom said no. (laughs) Like, what are you going to do? it's not uncommon. I mean, we have covered other cases, which obviously anything can happen anywhere, anytime, right? We know that. But I never went on a senior trip. I don't, I know people who have. I mean, it's not uncommon. Um, But you know. Yeah, a lot of people that live in this area will either go down to like Panama City or some people will go down to Cancun. Mm-hmm. 
Like, you know, it's a big thing. And of course, there's going to be drinking. Even if they went to Panama City, they're going to find a way to get alcohol. Like, Absolutely. And here, the legal drinking age is 18. I guess I just am thinking like, I would not want to have been one of those seven chaperones. Like that would have felt like a lot of pressure because 18 year olds who can legally drink and they can't do that in the States are going to do, they're going to feel invincible. They're going to drink all the time. They're going to like, they're going to go out. They're going to be going places. Like, you can't keep up with all of them. It would stress me out, but... I can't stand this! Natalie and some of her friends were in the casino at their hotel when she met a local 17-year-old boy named Joran van der Sloot. Joran mm -hmm. was born in the Netherlands, but was going to school in Aruba. They chatted at the casino, and then the group decided to head over to a local bar called Carlos and Charlie's in downtown... Oh, my... Orenistad? Orenstad? Orenstad? Orenistad? Um, Natalie and Yoran danced. They had drinks together. They were reportedly having a good time. Around 1 a.m., the bar was closing, so the group decided that they were going to head over to another bar. Natalie, she decided to head out with Yoran and his two friends, Deepak Kalpo, who was 21, and his brother Satish, who was 18. Natalie's friends had tried to convince her not to leave with them, but she was like, no, it's fine. I'm fine. They all thought that she was going to get a ride back to the hotel with the boys in a silver Honda. The next morning, Natalie's friends could not find her, but they saw that her bags and her passport were still in her hotel room. They notified a chaperone that they couldn't locate Natalie, and they called Beth, Natalie's mom, and the flight back home to Alabama took off without Natalie on board. So upon finding out that Natalie was missing and had not made it on her flight home, her family immediately made their way to Aruba. And I read that Beth got there and like from the time that she got the call that said we can't find Natalie, she was there within like 12 hours. Like she was there. Um, once they arrived, they immediately began searching for answers about where Natalie could be. So they first went to the hotel casino where she had first met Yoran. There, they were told by the night manager that Yoran often frequented the casino in order to pick up young girls on vacation. He supposedly really liked American girls, and it was like kind of his thing. Also, though, we should say that if you had to rate this case on a scale of like one to small town rumor mill on the amount of rumors in this case, you're as high as it'll go. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. So... Just a lot of people said that he did that. Small town bloody gossip. Beth asked the manager to see security camera footage and then decided to call the Aruban police. So they made their way to Carlos and Charlie's bar to get any information that they could. The police and Natalie's family then went to the Vandersloot residence where Yoran was questioned about what had happened the night that Natalie was missing or went missing. Paulus Vandersloot, Yoran's father, a lawyer and almost judge, kept a close eye while Yoran was being questioned. So, at, like, at very first, Yoran was like, never heard of her, never seen her, I don't know who she is. And then he said, okay, I did meet her. I did leave the bar with her um, and the Calpo brothers, Deepak and Satish. He said that after they left the bar, they went to the lighthouse at Arashi Beach on the northwest tip of the island, and then to Shark Watch before dropping her off at the hotel. Yoran said that they dropped her off at the hotel around 2 a.m. The Calpo brothers corroborated this story. Uh, Yoran agreed to take the police and Natalie's family to the hotel where he claimed he and the Calpo brothers dropped Natalie off and told them that Natalie had fallen and hit her head while she got out of the car, but she was fine and she went on into the hotel. He also claimed that he knew the guard and he could corroborate the story, but the guard wasn't there at the time. And also, remember, this is one of, like, 18 million stories he's going to tell, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the Calpo um, brothers, too. They changed their story. Yeah, a bunch of times. On June 1st, 2005, Natalie had not yet been declared as a missing person, but the search had begun. There were approximately 100 tourists and locals searching the area for Natalie. Some of the chaperones stayed back to help search. Like, I mean, they did what they could. In the following weeks, the search expanded to include volunteers from the U.S., the Aruban police, Dutch Marines, and three F-16 fighter planes from the Netherlands. And Aruba is a colony of the Netherlands. Like, Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, 
Curacao, I think St. Mar- Martin is the other one. And then, of course, there's Netherlands. So, like, a lot of Dutch people here. This is where Dutch people, like, vacation. There's a lot of Dutch food on these islands. Like, all of that stuff. So, I that's thought, why Netherlands. As per Joey from Friends, I thought the Netherlands was that made-up place with Captain Hook and the Lost Boys. Oh, it's not real. Yeah, I just made that up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You Just have to change to your my... money to Vermont money to go there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. Yeah. On June 5th, the first two arrests were made in the investigation. Two former security guards from a hotel that was closed for renovations at that time were arrested. So Yoran and the Calpo brothers claimed that they had seen a guard approaching Natalie outside of her hotel after dropping her off. Um... However, it was determined they had absolutely nothing to do with Natalie's disappearance and were released June 18th. One of the guards told police that one of the Calpo brothers had told him, while they were all in jail together, that he and his brother had left Natalie and Yoran at a beach near the hotel. On June 9th, Yoran, Vandersloot, and both Calpo brothers were arrested and held on possible charges of first-degree or second-degree murder and kidnapping resulting in death. The Aruban Attorney General, Karen Janssen, had said that they had been hoping that one of the boys would lead the police to definitive evidence, so that's why they hadn't been taken into custody right away. On June 14th, the beach was searched for evidence, but nothing was found. The next day, the Vandersloot residence was searched, and police seized two vehicles, computers, and cameras. Paulus, Joran's father, was questioned, and he was arrested on June 22nd, along with Steve Gregory Crows, a party boat DJ who had been reported to have connections to Natalie's disappearance. They both were released on June 26th. They couldn't find anything. Satish admitted to lying to the police when he was first questioned, and now he is changing his story. He now says that he and Deepak dropped Natalie and Yoran off at the hotel. That's the last time they saw them. I have no idea. A gardener at the Aruba Racket Club gave a statement to police saying that he saw all three of the men in a car near the club in the Marriott Hotel around 2.30 a.m. This is when the Calpos claimed to have already been home. This so is are we so still lying? frustrating. Go, like, tell the truth. Oh, my gosh. Because I watched this movie called Liar, Liar, and the message was don't lie. I'll never understand people who have been in a situation where... Whether it's an accident or on purpose, maliciously, something bad happens and then you're like, I'll just lie about it. I'll just keep lying. I'll never ever tell the truth. I'll never say anything. And I get because you're going to get in trouble, right? But I don't get it. I just, I'll never understand it. It's just, yeah, it's just evil because these are three people who have, I'm going to say maybe his dad too, but who have no conscience. Mm -mm. No compassion for other people, no integrity whatsoever. Like, they don't care. And we're going to get into all the stuff that makes us say that. But, yeah, how do you... Like, I get that you're afraid you're going to get in trouble, but if, if, if legitimately you did not do anything wrong and something just happened to her... Telling lie after lie after lie after lie is only hurting the case. It's going to get you in more trouble. That's what I don't understand, too. Like, now you're digging yourself in deeper when you could have just been like, okay, we dropped him off here. And, like, if that's what really happened, like, just... uh, Yeah. And putting a family through more That's what I was going to say. Yeah. That's just awful. Searches continued with volunteers, locals, the Marines, and divers. Sonar equipment was used and several leads were given and being followed up on. A search in August was conducted after a tip that a sonar machine had detected human bones, but the divers came up empty. A pond near the Marriott, uh, where the gardener had seen the boys, was also drained, but again, nothing turned up. Six weeks after Natalie's disappearance, her family put up a reward of $200,000 for her safe return and a reward of $100,000 for any information on what happened to her. By the end of July 2005, the reward for her safe return had been increased to $1 million. So Beth ended up staying in Aruba for two months following Natalie's disappearance, and then Dave made several trips back and forth looking for his daughter. 
The family hired private investigator T.J. Ward in 2005 to help with the case, and he's still working on it. He's never given up the search for Natalie. Yoron and the Calpo brothers were released from jail initially on July 4th. Um, the Calpos were arrested again in August, two weeks after Beth had left the island, and then they were again released on September 3rd. And it's interesting because in the United States, if you get arrested, you have to be charged with something within, what, 24, 48 hours, or they gotta let you go. But they kept some of these people in jail for, like, three months. Like, Yoron was in jail for, like, three months at one point, and they had no charges on him whatsoever before they finally let him go. Like, I guess you can just keep people a lot longer there, but... During the investigation, Yoran's story continued to change. He was traveling around to different countries. He talked a lot about the investigation. He actually relished being in the spotlight, and he was excited because now he's famous. People know his name. People know who he is. It's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, it's gross that to be known for... Something like, that just really shows his character, right? Obviously. Paulus van der Sloot, Joran's father, was a prominent lawyer on the island of Aruba during that time that Natalie went missing. He was also in the process of becoming a judge, like we said, and Natalie's family believes that the Aruban police helped to cover up what happened because the police commissioner at the time was Paulus's best friend as well as Joran's godfather. Well, I guess I'm not surprised. The island of Aruba, teeny tiny, very small, but no trace of Natalie was found. Sorry, it definitely, like, I don't know, because it is a really small island, so I don't know if, like, this person could have, like, was there another law enforcement entity that could have taken over it so that there was not that tie there, you know? I don't know. I know in the United States, that's typically what will happen. But, I mean, it doesn't look good, but it, it did... The police did get out and do searches and they seized stuff at their house and things like that, but... Um, and the amount of times that Yoron, he was arrested and held, it seems like... Uh, it's just... I, I, don't, right. I don't know. In February of 2006, a suit filed with the Supreme Court of New York accused Yoron Vandersloot of malicious, wanton, and willful disregard of the rights, safety, and well-being of Natalie. It claimed that Paulus enabled Yoran's predatory behavior, but was dismissed on August 3rd, 2006. A judge determined that local taxpayers would only have ephemeral interest in seeing the case through. In December of 2006, Beth and Dave filed a wrongful death suit against the Calpo brothers in a Los Angeles Superior Court. Unfortunately, the location made it unable to go through and the judge dismissed it over a lack of jurisdiction on June 1st, 2007. In November of 2007, Yoran and the Calpo brothers were again arrested because of new incriminating evidence. They were charged with involvement in the voluntary manslaughter of Natalie Holloway or causing serious bodily harm to Natalie Holloway, resulting in her death. Unfortunately, the evidence didn't move the case forward and they were released on December 7th. On December 30th, 2007, divers searched a fish trap off the coast of Aruba after photos of what appeared to be a human skull were found. Nothing of relevance was found in the trap. In 2008, a Dutch reporter recorded van der Sloot saying that Natalie collapsed when they were on the beach together and he was unable to revive her. He said that he and a friend disposed of her body from a boat, and after finding out that he was recorded, van der Sloot insists that he was lying when he said that. Okay. Why say it? He is relishing the fame of this. And so if he continues to be involved, I think he is involved, but if he continues to be involved, then he gets more attention again. And he does not care what kind of attention he gets as long as it's there. Paulus Vandersloot ended up dying of a heart attack in February of 2010. And it's reported that Yoran spun out of control with drugs and alcohol following his father's death. In March of 2010, Joran sent an email to Beth's attorney, John Kelly, with an offer to reveal the location of Natalie's body in exchange for $25,000 up front and another $225,000 to follow. What a piece of human garbage. Yeah. 
So Beth agreed. Her lawyer relayed the information to the FBI. On May 10th, John Kelly took $10,000 to Aruba and met with Yoran. Yoran led Kelly to a house and told him that his father, Paulus, had buried Holloway in the foundation. And then after this, they wired another $15,000 to Yoran's bank account in the Netherlands to make that $25,000 down payment. It was later revealed that it was a false location, of course. Which if he knew, if he, knew he was lying, and he's desperate for money now, right? Because his dad's dead, so he doesn't have the person who's funding him mm -hmm. around anymore. And, and possibly the one who's getting him out of trouble, too. But he's also a gambler. He gambles all the time. Around this time, he's like a professional poker player. But I think he is, the way he gambles, it's, it's not just a profession. It seems to be possibly an addiction. Like, he's gambling a lot, and he had been. So, if you know that you're lying about it, wouldn't you ask for more money up front? Like, because you know that once once you get the 25000 and you lead them to a false location, they're not going to give you the two twenty five. It's just weird that he wasn't like, I want 100000 up front, and then I'll get the rest. You know, like... yeah. I mean, it's good that he didn't because it's an extortion thing, but I just, like, it doesn't make sense to me because I'm like, why wouldn't you ask for more money up front? Well, yeah, he doesn't sound like he's playing with a full deck of cards. Exactly. Poker reference. So by the time they figure out that he had lied about this, he has been traveling and he has now made it to Peru with the money. Yoron spent three weeks in Peru spending the money that Beth had given to him in return for answers about where she could find her daughter's remains. While in Peru, five years to the day after Natalie went missing, Yoron killed Stephanie Flores Mar uh, Ramirez in his hotel room in Lima. Yoron confessed to killing her after she had used his computer to look up Natalie. Yeah, he, he beat this woman to death, strangled her. Like, they had met apparently playing poker, and she goes up to his room with him, and supposedly they were, like, playing poker on his computer, and either something came in about Natalie, or she looked him up and found he was, like, connected to this or whatever, and he flipped out and killed her. His initial story was self-defense, that she had attacked him. Get, get out of here with that. You know, he has no marks on him. He beat her to death. Then... He goes downstairs, leaves her body in the room, gets coffee and a Danish or something, like goes down and eats. And then he tells the he tells the hotel staff that he locked himself out of his room because he wanted them to find her body because it's in his room. Like there's nothing you can do about that. So they unlock the door for him. But when they open the door, you couldn't see her body from the door. So they were like, all right, have a nice day, sir. And they go back downstairs and he's like, well, shit. So instead of trying to get rid of her body, it stayed there. And he, you know, tried to get out of there, but her body was found in the room. He was registered. Like, dude. I know. He is a disgust. On June 3rd, 2010, Yoran was arrested in Chile. Chile? 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 And held in the high security Castro Castro prison. On June 27, 2010, Yoran was indicted for wire fraud and extortion in the United States for his attempt to get $250,000 from Beth. And it was said that authorities didn't arrest him immediately after he received the wire payment because there wasn't sufficient evidence to do so. But, but if we knew he lied and we knew he... I mean, th that's straight up extortion. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how that works and, like, what you have to have. But, like... It seems like there was sufficient evidence to me. And he killed somebody right after that. Mm -hmm. Like, had he not made it to Peru, Stephanie Ramirez would still be alive. Uh-huh. Yoran was sentenced to 28 years in prison and is currently serving his time in a Peru prison. He was also ordered to pay $75,000 in reparations to Stephanie's family. At this time, it was said that Yoran would not be extradited to the U.S. for the extortion charges for 25 years. On January 12, 2012, a day before Yoran's sentencing, Dave Holloway requested that Natalie be formally declared dead. Beth was against this, but an Alabama judge agreed with Dave. I didn't know about this in uh, a Peru prison, but apparently 
Like, Joran's married now, or I don't know if he's still married, but he did get married. He had a daughter. He gets conjugal visits. He gets to wear street clothes. He gets to... He eats good food. Like, a pair. I would have thought... I don't know. I just would have thought that, like, the prison experience wouldn't be like that there. I mean, I do know there, for attempted murder, you can't get more than two years. We learned that in Worst Roommate Ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently he's got a pretty sweet situation there, and he absolutely does not want to get taken to the United States. Not going to be sweet and cushy. Exactly. Has, yeah. Throughout the years following Natalie's disappearance, Dave never quit searching for his daughter, and Beth didn't either. She's an incredible activist, activist advocate. Like, she is doing the work. She got into some tiffs with the Aruban people, I guess, because... You know, she was, they didn't like the negative media attention. Um, They felt like she was basically saying that, like, Aruban people were bad, not just Yoron Vandersloot. And, you know, like, it got, it got kind of messy. I think she was arrested at one point there. Like, there's just a lot that happened, but um, she certainly was searching too. But Dave, at that time, or since then, has been taking several trips back to Aruba he follows every lead with his private investigator, T.J. Ward. Um, they're, the leads they've gotten have ended up being dead ends. Um, but despite this, he takes each one and he follows it through until the end. There was an Oxygen series called The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway. And it follows Dave, T.J., and his team of investigators on a lead that they received from someone close to the case. Let us save you the time of watching this six-part series. Six parts. Six parts. And listen, there's a lot in this case, and I understand that it would need to be more than one part or else, lest it be like four and a half hours or something, you know, way longer. Six was um, extreme. It was a little... But Oxygen loves to do that. They do, and I feel like instead of calling it the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, they should have called it the exploitation of the family of Natalie Holloway. It was horrible. It was one of the most exploitative pieces I have ever seen Oxygen do, and Oxygen is good at that. Shame on you. But it was even, it was like a new low even for Oxygen. It was awful. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't finish it. I could not finish it. There's no reason to. And because you know that going into filming that, none of these are filmed without knowing what all the pieces are, right? Because they're planning things out. They're staging phone calls based on things that have already happened. You know, none of this is actually a surprise. So you know that going into it, they knew that this wasn't going to go anywhere. I feel like they knew that. But they still put, I mean, Dave is legitimately trying to find his daughter here. Yes. And at this point, he's trying to find her remains. And it's just awful. Like, so, anyway. On September 15th, 2015, Dave received an unsolicited call from a man named Gabriel, who was living with a guy that had previously lived with Joran Vandersloot. So Gabriel's roommate claimed that he knew where Natalie's remains were. In 2016, Gabriel told TJ that Yoran had told this roommate, his name is John Ludwig, was, excuse me, that Natalie had been foaming at the mouth and wouldn't stop when they were supposedly on the beach together that night. So Yoran had then called his father, Paulus, who helped him to bury the body. And then in 2010, according to John, Yoran became paranoid that Natalie's remains would be found because of all these new searches that were taking place. So he offers John $1,500 to go dig up the body and move it for him. John, uh, being the supportive friend that he was, agreed to do this. And John also had some pretty significant addiction issues. He needed the money. Yoran knew that. So it's a recipe for John's going to do what he needs to do to get this money, basically. Um, John said that Yoran told him that Natalie's body was in the National Forest, and he dug it up, took it to a morgue, and had it cremated. Um, and supposedly he told the morgue that it was his pet, family pet, and that's why he was having it cremated. 
and then they threw it into the ocean at low tide. TJ confirmed via his passport that John Ludwig was in Aruba at the time that this allegedly occurred. So TJ and Dave set up a face-to-face meeting with Gabriel after 18 months of correspondence. Dave sat with Gabriel where he told him everything that he'd told TJ the year before, but now he's got some additional details. Gabriel told Dave that the Calpo brothers dropped Yoran and Natalie off in an alley next to the Marriott Hotel where they walked to the beach and they had two drinks in hand. Dave believes that Yoran then spiked Natalie's drink with GHB, the date rape drug. And according to Dave, you could pay the bartender at Carlos and Charlie's 25 bucks and they would spike a drink for you. This is outrageous! What a cute side hustle. Yeah, that's disgusting. You're the worst person in the world! Absolutely. Gabriel says that Yoran went in for a kiss with Natalie, but she started foaming at the mouth and choking on her own vomit. So he panics, he calls his dad. When Paulus arrived, he determined that Natalie was dead, and then he went home to retrieve a burlap sack. Gabriel then explains to Dave that Natalie's body did not fit into the burlap sack. So they, quote, stomped on her body to dismember it in order for it to fit. I googled this this morning. Can you stomp on a body to dismember it? Excuse us, we're with the FBI. I'm probably gonna get flagged for that, but like the only thing that was coming up was what I believe is a video game called Dead Space because there was a lot of stomping bodies and there's like a whole Reddit thread dedicated to this. So I think it's a game where you can maybe do something like that. But, I mean, I've never personally heard of a case where somebody does that and successfully dismembers a body. Well, and, I mean, we're going to go there because this is what we're talking about. It, it feels morbid to go into detail, but we're talking about it. I've heard of people who have dismembered bodies with saws and knives and things and so that they had such a difficult time even doing it with right. an instrument like that. So stomping on a body, like, that doesn't sound... Now, I've never done it. Be honest with you. Never have. Never tried. Um, This is something, if it's true, this is something that I wouldn't even do to an animal, to a bug. You know what I mean? Like, I don't... If it's true, this is... What are we doing? What? I know. I just... I mean, we've covered a lot of cases, and there have been a good percentage of them have dismemberment somewhere in the process. And I have just never, ever, ever seen a case where they said that the way that they dismembered a body was to stomp it. Like, if you guys know of any cases, let us know in the comments that have that aspect to it. But I don't, I can't think of any. So I feel like it's a farce. Yeah, like it just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So they said that they put the burlap in the back of Paulus's car and drove to the national park where they dug a hole for her body and placed a cactus over it once the dirt had been replaced. And he repeats what John told him about digging up her body and he believes that John did this 100%. Dave and TJ are hoping this, you know, that if the story is true, they'll be able to find DNA evidence either in the hole where her body was allegedly placed initially or in the trunk of John's aunt's car that he used to move the body from the gravesite. If I'm John's aunt, I'm pissed at him right now. Mm -hmm. Dave told TJ that the story seemed credible to him because of where John claimed that the Calpo brothers dropped Natalie and Yoron off. According to Dave, he was one of only two people that knew that she was dropped off by the Marriott, not at a fisherman's hut, which had been the story that the media heard. So he's thinking... He's got information that he couldn't have gotten in the media, so it seems credible. They set up a sting operation to get John to confess on tape, and they wanted to get this information and then take it to the Aruban police. So they set Gabriel up, um, they set a trip up for him and John to go to New Orleans because Louisiana is a one-party state, so meaning um, you can record somebody without the other person knowing it. Um, and Gabriel agreed to be recorded and they like, you know, wire this room up for Jesus and whatever. Um, 
While on the trip to New Orleans, John told Gabriel several things that were recorded and put into their files for the Aruban police. John told Gabriel that he and Yoron would rape girls four times a week and they did use drugs in order to do so. Why can't you find some other hobby to do four times a week, like uh, volunteer or badminton? Anything. Literally yeah. anything else. Like, Literally are you serious? Anything. That's, it's, mm. Mm-hmm. And John said it was only a couple times that the girls were passed out when they did this. So that's not that bad, right? Like, fraction-wise, it's like only sometimes they were passed out. So that's makes it not as bad. Right. I want to vomit. I'm not on the run, please. Yeah. John talked about how O.J. Simpson wrote his book, If I Did It, and that he could go on TV and talk about what happened hypothetically, too. John also told Gabriel he could take him to where he dug up Natalie's remains, but they weren't really in a national park like he said they were. Of course not. He said that the gravesite was actually a 10-minute walk from his aunt's house at the top of the mountains off of a path in a cul-de-sac. Because of this, Dave and TJ were concerned about the validity of the story now that it has changed. And if, I mean, again, nobody in this case cares anything about anybody but themselves. Absolutely. It's just yeah. awful to do to people. It's just awful. Mm -hmm. John continued to talk about Yoron and how he and Yoron would have threesomes with the girls they picked up. And he actually blames Stephanie Flores Ramirez for Yoron being in jail because it's her fault that it's her fault that he made she made so she made him kill her is that mm -hmm. what we're is that okay that's what we're, okay this guy's gonna get his comeuppance so you just wait so john told gabriel that yoran used his laptop to send emails to beth's attorney and that he did offer him fifteen hundred dollars to move natalie's remains he said that after he dug up her bones he opened the burlap and there was brown and black fluid on them and there was a smell that almost made him vomit. He said he used his aunt's blue Mitsubishi to transport the remains where they stayed overnight. John said that Yoron dug up a dog buried in the cemetery and then put those bones on top of Natalie's body and drove to the crematory. What is wrong with you? And he said that he paid $200 cash to push the remains in the incinerator himself. Is that a common thing? In different parts of the world, you can just bring stuff and be like, I would like to have this cremated, please. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Because, yeah, here it's like it's kind of a process and only the people that work there are operating this stuff, I would think. So, yeah. yeah. After the trip to New Orleans, TJ and his team were confident that the recordings would be useful for reopening the case and taking John into custody. They knew the recordings would not be admissible in court, but they were just hoping it would kind of open the door. TJ and his team were working on getting a trip back to Aruba put together where they would be able to deliver their information to the Aruban authorities, but they needed Gabriel to bring John to Aruba as well to physically show him where the gravesite was. While this was being set up though, Gabriel's patience with John was wearing thin and he decided to quit the investigation. Despite this, TJ and his team flew to Aruba and began working on how they could locate the two potential grave sites. They knew the location of John's aunt's house because Gabriel was able to locate it on a map before he quit. So they drove around looking for a cul-de-sac that could potentially be the one that John spoke about. And they found a potential site and moved on to the next phase of their plan. After finding the spot, they met with Dr. Jason... Kolowski, a DNA analyst, and he listened to John's recordings and determined that what John said of the remains after opening the burlap was an accurate description of what they would be like five years later. Dr. Kolowski said that the fluid from the body should still be present at the gravesite, but it would and it would be black, tarry, and soapy. And he also said that the decomp material would not be DNA comparable. They, then they went with Dr. Kolowski to potential grave sites where it was determined that the national park was unlikely because of the visibility and hardness of the clay. But Dr. Kolowski determined that the site near John's aunt's house would be a viable place. While they were doing this, Dave was working on convincing Gabriel to go to Aruba and help with the investigation. Before Gabriel, John, and both of their girlfriends arrived in Aruba, Dave goes to Aruba. 
TJ brought in another person to assist with the search, which was Tracy Sargent. Tracy is a canine search and rescue specialist, and she and her human uh, remains detection dog, Chance, went out to the site as well. According to Tracy, Chance can detect human remains anywhere from two hours old to 250 years old. It's very impressive. Now that Gabriel was ready to help again, and finally in Aruba, the team gave him a GPS tracker and instructed him to take photos of the gravesite John led him to and to drop the tracker there. So John took Gabriel to his aunt's house and then to the alleged gravesite where Gabriel took several photos and videos, but Gabriel didn't charge the GPS tracker. So he ended up having to retrace the steps with TJ and the team to show them where John had led him. Oxygen knew that, right? Like, yeah. that just is going to add dramatic flair. Like, what? You didn't charge the tracker? Oh, no. Now what are we going to do? Like, you it's know what I mean? So it just put on. The whole thing is, I mean, and I don't know. We could go through everything that happened in that, but essentially nothing comes of any of this no not at all it's just a bunch of horse like mm -hmm. what a waste after being led to the alleged gravesite tj compiled all of the information they had and he and dave met with the reuben authorities they met with chief richardson for three hours and they were optimistic about john being taken into custody there was an immediate order for the blue Mitsubishi to be searched, and the next day, the Aruban authorities were searching the area with TJ's team and Dave present. Chief Richardson told them that they had plans to take John, Gabriel, and their girlfriends into custody the next day and asked them to continue surveilling them in the meantime. The next day, which was March 21st, 2017, that was the day that John and Gabriel were supposed to leave Aruba, and Gabriel decided that he was going to leave without John. Gabriel and his girlfriend left the airport without John and Lauren, who was John's girlfriend. And shortly after, John and Lauren ran out of the hotel. They made it to the airport with 15 minutes to spare. They boarded their plane. And unfortunately for Dave and the team, they made their flight and they left the island before any arrest could be made. So then we go back to the U.S. They're meeting with the FBI. John was hoping that if he did talk to them that he could somehow like maybe make a deal lessen charges against him something like that it didn't really seem like anything came of that though either and they do another recorded interview with john and john told tj the private investigator that they were watching the lifetime movie about natalie one night um he and yoron and yoron was like picking apart details of the movie and Yoran said it was an accident, and because of the combination of drugs and alcohol that Natalie was on, he said it would look like he had raped her? How so? Like, from what I can tell, from what I understand, no matter what combination of alcohol and drugs you put into your body, none of those cause physical evidence of rape, and none of them produce somebody else's semen in your parts. Right. Absolutely. That doesn't make any sense to me. But um, he, you know, is implying that his dad helped him cover it up. I mean, and his dad's dead, so he's throwing him under the bus all over the place now. Just like, he did it, he did it, he did it. So, I mean, essentially, again, nothing comes of it. Like, they end up finding some bones in a Ziploc bag. Um, cause he said he kept a trophy and they, he said he found this at his aunt's house. They go through all this trouble to have these bones tested for DNA. And then they need Beth's, a swab from Beth because they have to test the mitochondrial DNA. And then they say, well, it's not a match. Um, well, because but parts of the bones in that Ziploc bag were dog bones. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, they, it wasn't there were all... four bones in the bag. and Yeah. Like, initially, they say, okay, it's not a match, but we can do this mitochondrial DNA testing, which was also determined to not be a match. But then he says, the doctor says, well, but it's not a full exclusion because there could be underlying profiles that aren't coming through. So they do this, like, final phytomilo test. I'm not really sure. Um, and it was determined that the bones did not belong to Natalie Holloway, but they don't know who they belong to. 
why does he have a bag with somebody, any person's bones? You know, like, what What are you, what is wrong with this guy? And I'm guessing if they did mitochondrial DNA testing on it, then they are, they're confirming that they are human bones, right? I would think so, yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah, what, whose bones are they? That's like when... In an investigation, when the police, like, drain a pond or something looking for evidence, and they're like, oh, well, we've, I can't remember what case it was that we covered, but there was one where they drained this pond looking for somebody's car, and they actually found, like, 27 other cars in the pond. Yes. And they were like, yeah, but none of them were the car we were looking for. I'm like, I'm sorry. I need, like, a whole... Whose cars are those cars? (laughs) Why is there... (laughs) This isn't where I parked my car. I don't even... But, okay, guess what, though, guys? So, in 2018, Mm -hmm. John Ludwig was killed by a woman he was attempting to kidnap. Oh. Sorry to hear that, John. Everyone in this case, minus the family. Like, don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? Like, the people that were talking about suspects and things like that, they are some shady-ass people. Like, what is wrong with all of these people? I just... Every single one of them. Yeah. These are just people who have absolutely no conscious conscience no regard for any other human being ever but themselves yeah like it just because john is saying like we know he tried to kidnap somebody i don't think that's the first time he did that i wouldn't say and he said you know whether or not everything that he said is true he's admitting to routinely raping women by drugging them these are just horrific people it is scary and the fact that you have that many people what i'm counting four at this point you know what i mean four people that are disgusting and awful human beings and they somehow end up in the same place at the same time and find each other like that's terrifying okay so back to john ludwig the woman that he or the woman that ended up killing him and that he was attempting to kidnap He had previously been roommates with her, but he wanted something more, and she did not. He ambushed her outside of her home while getting out of her car, and she was able to wrestle a knife away from him, and she stabbed him in the abdomen. He was airlifted to a hospital where he died of his injuries. Mm -hmm. I feel nothing. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. Hopefully, she does not... I don't know what it would be like to take somebody's life, even in that type of situation. I hope that she doesn't struggle with that or if she has, hopefully has gotten to a good place with it. But um, I'd rather her than him. I'll just say that. You know what I mean? Like, we don't, we don't need. He's dead now, so we can never get information. Like, he's, he's, I don't see any way that if he was still alive that he would have this change of heart and be like, you know what? I'm going to tell the actual truth now. I mean, he, like, he went through that entire series just bullshitting. Wasting time, resources. Yeah. And he knows about Dave. He knows about, yeah, he didn't care. Nope, not even a little bit. Dave Holloway said that after this this last lead, he was going to do his best to move on with his life. And in 2022, Beth Twitty went back to Aruba with Nancy Grace our favorite to film another show but was threatened to be arrested by Aruban authorities for filming in the hotel without permission beth has said that she has found peace with what happened to natalie yoran vandersloot is still in prison in peru and remains the number one suspect for natalie's disappearance beth has set up a web-based center for education and crime prevention with crime museum called the natalie holloway research center It is noted that this is not a recovery center, but a place for information on how to help. And if a loved one is missing, you should absolutely contact law enforcement immediately. I also read that Beth sued Oxygen over that special. um, And she did so on the grounds that it was just to exploit the family, that they knew full well that they were not going to get any information out of it. Um, and all that stuff. And it was set to go. I tried to look up like what the outcome of that trial was because it was set to go to trial in 2020. And I don't know if it got I can't find anything that says it was dismissed. So I don't know. Maybe settled out of court if it's been delayed or yeah, settled out of court. But there's literally like the last article on it is in February of like, I think February of 2019. 
There's a bunch from 2018 when it was like announced that she was taking them to trial, but I can find nothing about the outcome of it. That's really like if they won or if they got anything or anything like that. But they should. They should have gotten because I mean we covered Mara Murray. Mara Murray, excuse me. And mm-hmm. I don't like what Oxygen does with these a multi-part series at all personally i just Mm-mm. i do not Mm-mm. find them i find them to be exploitative and um it's just wrong i think it's wrong what they do because they're treating it like it's some salacious um yeah. tv show for everybody's entertainment and the thing is while people do find true crime interesting obviously we we all do but it's not at the expense of the family like that and this like you said they hit an all-time low with this and I just I could not bring myself I was like I had to turn it off like I'm kept the flames flames on the sides of my face possibly the worst piece I've ever seen them put together because they're trying to come at it from this angle of like we're gonna any any of those things that say they're gonna solve it like there's one on I think Hulu I don't remember who did it maybe Discovery Plus I'm not totally sure who did it but uh Finding Andrea, I think. It's uh, about this woman who's been missing for several years now. It's like a four-part series. They get the gang together to investigate it and go talk to people and blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing. Like, nothing comes of it. It's totally exploitative. They're trying to leave you on these cliffhangers. Um, and while you might be able to do that while you're telling the story of a case, if you if you do have to split it into parts... Like, you might leave on a, you know, something that's like, okay, well, this was interesting or, you know, I didn't expect this twist. Like, I didn't expect John Ludwig to get killed while he was in the process of kidnapping somebody. Like, that's kind of a twist or whatever. But they're doing it like they're trying to create cliffhangers. I mean, they're scripting it. Like, they're they're making a narrative that is not what's actually happening and... The goal is very clearly not to find Natalie. It's all about money, isn't it? It's just to get ratings, and they know that it's a high-profile case, and people are going to want to watch it. Right. And the family just has to suffer. I cannot even. You imagine. know, because Dave, Dave, legitimately is trying to find his daughter. So he's gonna if he gets a lead, if Oxygen, you know, at that time, I don't know that he would do it again. But at that time, if Oxygen approached him and said, "Hey," We'll give you X amount of dollars to do whatever with this investigation. He's going to take it because he's trying to find his daughter. Right. You know, and they're meanwhile sitting up in their office like, yeah, he doesn't know this, but. We're just trying to rake in dollar bills. We're pulling all the strings up here. Yeah. It's just awful. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, we've talked about it, but the staged phone calls, the, you know, that kind of stuff. I can't. I just can't get behind something like that. I, um, and I honestly don't want to. Now, oxygen has its place in my heart, snapped, things like that. But honestly, just snapped, I think. But they've, they've taken a dive off the deep end and I'm not, not, not thrilled about it. Don't like yeah. it. I, I don't want to support it. Yeah. Their multi part series are just Gabbage. typically all like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So save yourself the time and heartache and anger. Yeah. I think, what do you think happened? Do you think that he deliberately killed her? I think Yoran had everything to do with it. Absolutely. I don't. Or do you think it was an accident and he tried to cover it up? I don't think it was an accident. To be honest with you, I really don't. Um, I think because he has proven that if somebody makes him mad enough for whatever reason, he is going to take matters into his own hands. So let's say that maybe the date rape, I think that he absolutely date raped, uh, uh, drugged her. Um, yes. I wonder if he got mad because maybe she had gotten sick or something. And then he was like, well, for, for whatever reason, maybe she was coherent enough to say, no, I don't want to do this. You know, that's what I think mm-hmm. happened. Yeah. He's got anger issues. I he also... has n- absolutely no conscience, like you said, or moral standing. I just don't, he doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. I know in one of his stories where he said that they took her body and in a boat and like dumped her yeah. in the ocean or whatever, he told one person, well, it was in the, it was in that video that the journalist took. And he said, are you sure that she was dead when you dropped her off the boat? And he's like, no, I wasn't totally sure. She seemed dead. Like, I don't know. I go, I go back and forth between 
Like before hearing about Stephanie Ramirez, I would have said it was probably an accident, some kind of an overdose, something like that. And he freaked out and dumped her body because he didn't want to get in trouble. But then you hear about that and it's like, okay, well, he has deliberately killed somebody because of whatever. Um, I, it, it could just go either way, but I I fully believe that he's got everything to do with it. Absolutely. He was and there. I, he knows what happened. I will also say that I hate his conditions in his Peruvian prison. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that is fair, but at all. But I will say that, unfortunately, it took another victim to put him in jail, but that's where he belongs. Yep. That's where he deserves to be. Yeah. So, I read that he probably married this woman and had a child with her because once you, like, have a child with somebody there or something, it makes it harder to extradite you for other things or something like that. Like, you know, I mean, you you just can't. His intentions are almost always nefarious. And always. Self-serving. Mm-hmm. To a fault. He I don't think he's ever done anything for anybody else. You know what I mean? Like I don't I don't think he is he's capable mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. It's just awful. Well, of course so, we want to know what it. you guys think. Yeah, let us know. Um what you think happened to Natalie and why you think Yoran did it, because he did. Yeah. Allegedly. But, <laughs> right. Can't say for a fact, but <laughs> But thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. We love you, and we will catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.